So what I'm looking at here is how to look at science of human endeavor for all sciences really, but particularly physics. And I guess it's just my take on it, but looking at some examples. Each of these articles also has a YouTube clip that I've uh, selected that you could go to to give you more detail about the article there. So when we go and look at science of human endeavor in a bit more detail here, we're trying to look for evidence of communication and collaboration. So if you see evidence of it being a global enterprise, the thing that you're actually looking at as an article, or it's showing clear communication or international conventions being used to share information between scientists, or they're doing some review of work and verification of results, uh, then that's the sort of stuff you're looking for is evidence that there's science to human endeavor in that regard. For the development of science there, and it's linked to science to human endeavor, we're looking for the development of ideas there based on a wide range of evidence, or how many sources are being used, or evidence of development across disciplines, or new technology being used to improve the efficiency, or change models, or modify models and theories. For the influence part, we're looking at advance in one field, being influenced by another field or influencing another field, okay? It's also the acceptance and use of science, I suppose, and how it's being influenced by social, economic, cultural or ethical factors. So we're looking at that link between science being influenced by society, or how much science is influencing society. In the last one, we're looking at application limitation there. So looking at the fact that scientists can develop solutions, make discoveries, that they're designing action for sustainability. So how it's being applied there, and they might evaluate economic, social and cultural cultural and environmental impacts and then offer explanations or solutions to that or make predictions. And that might have beneficial or even unexpected consequences there. They can also evaluate risk and opportunities for innovation can be made. And it also informs public debate and influences that. And it might actually have a limit in terms of what it can do. So there might be risks involved. And there's also possible conclusions made from that. So there's some of the key things we're looking for in Science to Human Endeavor. So what I've found here are three articles to start using to look at Science to Human Endeavor. So this particular one, they've developed some microbots here that can actually propel themselves through water and hunt down bacteria and kill it. So there's a YouTube clip on this if you want to watch some more details on this. If you look at this one here by Michael Irving in June 28 of this year, the swimming microbots can help purify the water by hunting down and killing the bacteria. The hunting down is really random there. So at the moment, we currently actually flush harsh chemicals through water to make it more drinkable there. And we could just send in a bucket of these swimming robots instead. And they've had European researchers developing these spherical microbots. Normally, the water is cleaned by this dose of chlorine. And the problem is that it can have ill effects on people. Now, this team of researchers adapted previous work with self-propelled swimming microbots done. And the Spanish scientists have now pitted them against the bacteria to actually um, test their merits as a chemical-free purification system. So when you look at this, you're trying to find evidence of science and human, human endeavor in those four fields that we talked about there. We're looking for communication and collaboration evidence, development evidence, influence, and application limitation evidence. So this is an example of an application here for science and human endeavor because the scientists have evaluated a situation. In this case, it's the environmental impact and the impact on society of having to use harsh chemicals and the effect that that has on the water. And they're gonna try and purify the water by this method where they've developed microbots. So it's a solution to the problem. So if you looking at these sort of like application ideas, scientists are finding a solution to the problem, having evaluated an impact, okay? If you look at the work that's being done here, this particular team is actually refining the work done uh, by a Max Planck team who are working on Janus particles, and they've actually adapted those there, so that it actually would be powered by chemical reactions and used as antibacterial weapons instead of the one used here, which is towards light sources. These particles are similarly two-faced, with one half made of magnesium and the other a mix of gold and iron and silver. And one side provides a propulsion by doing a chemical reaction there, so there's some chemistry involved there to create hydrogen bubbles to get it in propulsion. And the other side there scoops up the uh, microorganisms and kills them because they stick to gold layers and are destroyed by the silver nanoparticles. So again, that's some chemistry there. There's a bit of physics in the propulsion there, and you've also got biology there because they would have had to know which ways of killing the microorganisms. So it's definitely across disciplines. So if you go across disciplines here, you're really looking at the fact that you've got looking at development there uh, of science to human endeavor because this new technology and it's also across disciplines. So any evidence of new technology there that's being used uh, and any evidence across disciplines would be developed there of the knowledge there. Now, because we're using iron in this case, we can actually clean the water up by simply using a magnet to get it out. And that's what that's saying here, okay? And therefore, you end up with clean water having killed the microorganisms. Therefore, they don't leave any harmful waste. And so that's got big advantages. 
as I said, communication collaboration has been solved, shown here because it implies there was collaboration going on between scientists in Europe rather than just one country. Okay, so you could point that out. The stuff by the Max Planck team was obviously clearly communicated so that they can actually work and follow that information. Okay, so that would have been based on articles that they saw or uh, evidence of research papers. If you want to talk about influence here a bit, you could say that this is going to influence society and cultures in the future because obviously we can provide clean drinking water there. So it's science influencing future society by that regard. Also, the amount of economic support they get from society and um, parts of society there in terms of governments, I suppose, will influence just how well this is used or how well it's accepted across the world on a large scale. So you can actually find evidence in this one article then of the four different types of the she if you really push it there and try and explain the links there. The second article here is about using ultrasound or high frequency sound to take the heat out of the clothes drying. So rather than heating the clothes to get them to dry out, they've discovered that if you actually vibrate the water in the clothes with uh, high frequency sounds, you can actually cause evaporation to occur much faster with greater efficiency. This particular technology is new. There's scientists from the US Department of Energy working on that and they're working with colleagues from GE, General Electric Appliances, to try and see if this is going to be working. They've already tried testing this and they reckon that they can find clothes dryers that will be 70% more energy efficient than they are now, which is going to be significant because about 1% of America's total energy use is based on clothes drying. Okay, This uses this different system that I talked about and they've done some lab tests on there with this system there. So my YouTube link there shows some clothes being dried off or a piece of fabric being dried off much quicker. I think they equate 14 seconds there instead of several minutes to do the same job there. In this case it says it would take less than 20 minutes to dry a whole load of laundry as opposed to what could be hours there. So it's also a lot quieter there than conventional dryers and produces less lint. And they're trying to get this together, Oak Ridge National Lab and the scientists from there and GE to do a upscaling of that technology for a full size press dryer and then move into consumer ready dryer drum. So this is the sort of stuff we're getting it from. So if we look at the science of human endeavour stuff here, you could argue that there's a degree of science of human endeavour because there's collaboration going on between the scientists there and also the scientists and GE to get that successful. There's no mention of it being international at this stage, but there's definitely some collaboration going on there. So that's my take on it. Uh, this is also a good example of development in science of human endeavour because it's a new technology that's being used to improve efficiency and develop a, a solution to a problem. So that's a pretty good example of that. When you look further down here, the influence of science has been shown here because the promise of that reduced drying time will have an effect or an economic benefit for society in the future if they go on to a large scale with it. Okay, So the economic funding that the, this project receives from society will influence how well the science knowledge develops. But once they've got that science knowledge, how well it goes into society will depend on or be determined by social and economic considerations within society itself. So that's going to be a two-way street if you like. Lastly there, you could talk about the fact that this, it is an application because this is definitely evidence or an action by scientists that's going to be for sustainability there because it will reduce energy use there and therefore it will have an effect on global warming and, and that currently is a push by society to try and reduce that. Now if you look at the last article, it's about King Tut's dagger here by being tested by X-ray spectrometry. There's a YouTube clip for that one as well. They've been trying to work out the origin of the metal and the dagger there because it was, uh, has been much discussed since the uh, 1925 discovery there. The research project here was an international effort with scientists from multiple institutes including the Polytechnic from Turin which is in Italy, the Pisa one and the Egyptian Museum to try and work out the origins of this blade here. So the fact that it's being uh, involved uh, across different countries here shows it's an international collaboration. So there you have science and human endeavour again. They've been trying to test this, I suppose, without actually damaging the particular object because it is very rare and it's got a delicate nature there. And they've been trying to use non-destructive methods to do it. So it was earlier suggested that this was actually meteoric in nature. In other words, it was formed from metal that came from a meteorite. But it was never sort of officially confirmed there. So by using this uh, new technology here that we've had over the last few years, the team has shown that they've got accurate results without damaging the subject here. What was revealed is that the dagger in the museum contains nickel and cobalt at concentrations equal to the amounts observed in 11 known iron meteorites, especially those in that area though, across uh, Egypt. So this gave further evidence to a theory that they had a few years ago and uh, gave much more support to it. If you look at this here, what is the science of human endeavour involved here? 
you could argue then that not only is the international collaboration being used here to show the collaboration, and obviously that's going to be communicated between different people there in an effective way, you've also got some sort of a, a, a evidence that there's a development of the theory going on because you've got science from many disciplines here. The fact you've got the physics in the X-ray technology, they've compared it to chemical analysis of metals, which is a bit of a stretch, but they've also uh, linked that to archaeology in uh, this civilization. So it's actually scientists coming up with a solution to a problem that others have had there, I guess. So therefore, you've got the idea that this is a development. In the, you could also, I guess, argue that the international collaboration has verified some of the existing theories here, and because of that, that's more evidence of a collaboration as well. So there's a couple there that you could do as a she. Okay, thank you.